Hey, y'all. My name is Susan Sparks, and I'm the senior pastor here at Madison Avenue Baptist Church in New York City. We are a diverse community brought together by faith. We hope that you enjoy our service today. of my sermon is, He has risen. Now what? Oh, sorry. I should pause after that. So Jamie said, praise the Lord. I didn't let that come out. Let me start again. title of my sermon is, He has risen. Now what? Okay. That's good. That's, I like that better. So today is kind of a big day. Today is the spring business meeting for Madison Avenue Baptist Church. It is the Triborough Bike Tour in the middle of the rain. It is the first day of Ramadan for our Muslim brothers and sisters. It is Cinco de Mayo. Woohoo! And <clears throat> it's the day after Star Wars Day. Yes! Y'all know yesterday was officially Star Wars Day. Did you? 
which is so crazy because really today should be Star Wars Day because the movie was released on May 5th, but apparently some little smart aleck marketing person decided it needed to be on the 4th because you needed to be able to say, say it with me, may the 4th be with you. <laughs> Don't shoot the messenger here. Like, it's just craziness, but bottom line, today is a big day. That said, it's also kind of a big letdown day, too. You know, two weeks ago, it was Easter in all of its great glory. And a week ago, Heather Ketchum stood in this pulpit, took it by fire, and preached a fabulous sermon on faith and doubt. Amen. <laughs> but today is just a regular old Sunday. No hallelujah chorus, no Heather. Sorry. It's just back to reality, which is exactly like the timing of our scripture today from the book of John. There, the resurrection had come and gone. Jesus had appeared to the disciples in their house. He'd even let Thomas put his finger in Jesus' side. They'd all seen him. Jesus had definitely risen. Now what? The book of John, okay, doesn't actually use the words now what. All right, but, but you know that the disciples had to say some version of that. Think about it. One moment they're sitting in the house with the risen Messiah. And then, in the blink of an eye, he's gone. You know they must have just sat there for the longest time in a place of shock and maybe awe and joy and even spiritual ecstasy. But then, an hour later, a day later, whatever it took, one of the disciples probably started crawling out of that place of spiritual ecstasy and said something like, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but we're out of food. At some point, reality crashes back in. I mean, a risen Savior is great, but if you don't have dinner, you can only be excited for so long. Not shockingly, Peter then announces in verse 3, all right, I'm going fishing. And the rest of the disciples say in unison, we're coming with you. So they go out to the Sea of Galilee and they begin throwing their nets. Now, I don't know if we have fisher people here in the congregation, but if you've ever seen one of those like reality fishing shows, you ever watched um, like Alaska's Deadliest Catch? People, oh, thank God, because I was going to say, if somebody said no, I'd be like, uh, I've, I've never seen it, but I have, actually, now I'll admit it. Um, Alaska's Deadliest Catch, if you watch any of those programs, and even if you haven't, you can imagine throwing those nets over and over out of that boat is exhausting work. It's repetitive work. It's churning, monotonous, wearisome work. And what's worse, they don't catch a thing. Nothing. I mean, I think we can understand how that feels, or at least an aspect of it. We understand the spiritual ecstasy of Easter morning, and then the reality that crashes back in on Monday morning. The reality that we have to now go back to work to provide for ourselves which means for many folk engaging in physically or mentally exhausting work, repetitive work, churning, monotonous, wearisome work. A place, worst of all, where we feel like we aren't producing anything of worth. I mean, you ever had that question ring through your head? Why does any of this matter? <laughs> is anything I'm doing right now, does it matter? So here are the disciples, churning away, 
throwing their nets over and over, trying to produce something to eat and getting no results. And who shows up on the shore? Jesus. See, I've always been fascinated by the timing of this appearance, this third appearance in the book of John. I mean, Jesus could have chosen to appear in so many ways, so many more public or even royal ways. I mean, like, why didn't he choose to show up in, like, Pilate's throne room, right? Or why, or why not just show up in the temple? Or why not show up riding a fiery chariot down the Via Della Rosa, <laughs> the road literally that he had just dragged his cross up a few days before? No. Jesus chooses none of that. He chooses to appear to the disciples alone, in this sort of moment where no one's really around, and it's in their moment of failure. Jesus chooses to show up in the disciples' moment of failure, their moment of disappointment, disillusionment, disgrace. He chooses to appear in the midst of their churning, monotonous, wearisome work, work that was producing no results. It's in these times of empty nets that Jesus appears on the shore. And the irony is they don't even know who it is. So crazy. I mean, here they are. They're not catching any fish. This random guy shows up on the shore and hollers out a fishing tip. So what do they have to lose? They're like, okay, fine. So they throw their nets, cast their nets to the right. And we all know what happened. They couldn't haul the nets up because there was so much fish in it. And you know, the story could end there, and it would be a powerful message. Jesus stands with us in our empty nets, and through his words, our nets are full. And the people said, amen. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Jesus' story doesn't even stop there, powerful as it is. I mean, filling the nets was filling a physical need, food for the body. But what he does next is so much bigger. The scripture says when they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. And Jesus said, bring some of the fish that you've caught. Come, have breakfast. After a wet, cold, brutal night of fishing, there was this warm, crackling fire, a smell of freshly grilled food, and an outstretched hand saying, come, be fed. I mean, the image is so powerful. A fire, warmth, camaraderie, sustenance. Last week, CNN featured an article on the happiest countries of the world. This does link in. I'm going to show you how as we talk about it. Interestingly, the happiest countries in the world, at least now, are all Scandinavian. Norway, Finland, Denmark, which is so hilarious because you would think that all Scandinavians would be depressed because they live in countries where there's no sunlight, at least in the winter. It's all dark, cold parts of the world, right? But no. And they attributed this sense of happiness to something that the article called... Um, it's almost a, it's a sense of happiness that they said was almost a national pastime in some of these countries. In Norway, the word is kushli, kushli, which roughly translates to coziness. And they describe it like a feeling when you come in from the cold and wrap up in a blanket in front of a roaring fire and have around you loved ones and comfort food. And the article goes on to talk about the research that's been done of these factors of warmth and safety and food and camaraderie, how they all contribute to longevity, and they all contribute to a greater quality of life, and they all create a sense of happiness. I mean, I think that's a cushly coziness, a 21st century Scandinavian version of Jesus and the disciples from the book of John. I mean, it's an image that says we are safe, we are fed, we are not alone, we are loved. I mean, if you've ever read any early children, childhood, or parenting books, which, by the way, as a new grandparent, I have, 
<clears throat> these are just the basic core human things that every child craves. You are safe, you are fed, you are not alone, you are loved. And nothing on that front changes as we move into adulthood. We spend our entire lives looking for safety and sustenance and love. And in that one image of the fire on the shore and these three words come, have breakfast. Jesus provides it all. But that still leaves us with the question, he has risen. Now what? I'll leave you with this story and it's an answer. Thursday evening, Cheryl Sims and her friend Andrea sponsored beer and Bible at their house. Right, Cheryl's back there, raise your hand, Cheryl. Thank you again. And the discussion question was, tell us about your earliest memory of God. And Cheryl told this story from when she was about six, something like that, and she was visiting her aunt out in the country in Maryland, and she was riding this like little radio flyer go-kart up the street, the kind you pedal with your feet, you know, and the street was apparently really steep. And all of a sudden, as she's trying to go up the street, the chain breaks. So the chain, so the pedals aren't connected to the wheels, right? So here's little Cheryl, pedaling and pedaling and churning and churning and going nowhere, actually starting to sink backwards down the hill, kind of like the disciples. And her brother saw her and ran over and got behind her and started pushing her up the hill. All of a sudden, a car engine revs down the street and some guy with some souped up car comes tearing around the corner heading up the street and apparently when the brothers heard it, they bailed. They ran, leaving little Cheryl in her little radio flyer go-kart just churning and churning trying to get up the street. They left her. Bad brothers if you're watching. But Cheryl kept churning and churning and pedaling and pedaling as fast as she could over and over. And somehow, she got to safety before the car sped by. When she ran in the house and told her mom about it, her mom apparently just shook her head and said, Cheryl, God just saved you. And she paused a minute and said, God was surely with you. I mean, in the churning and the peddling and the monotonous, wearisome work that seems to produce no results in the times where we feel utterly abandoned and alone, God is surely with us. He has risen. Now what? Well, I'll tell you what. We go back to our little go-karts and our fishing boats and our homes, and our families, and our cubicles, and our jobs, and in faith, we start casting our nets again, over and over. Now, I know it's not easy getting up and pushing through that daily grind, the conference calls, and the meetings, and the unpaid bills, and the family quarrels, and the excruciating losses, and the unexplained suffering, but we push through. We keep casting we keep peddling because we know that in the midst of our disappointment and our disillusionment, even our disgrace, in the height of our monotonous, wearisome work where we feel we aren't producing anything of worth, Christ will appear. And when we see him and when we begin to act on his words, it's then that our nets will fill and we will hear his voice saying, don't be afraid, come, come, find rest, be fed, for I have risen. And the people said, Thank you.
of Janet Morley. May the God who dances in creation, who embraces us with human love, who shakes our lives like thunder, bless us and drive us out with power to fill the world with her justice. Amen.
Thanks for joining us. Madison Avenue Baptist Church is located at 31st and Madison Avenue in New York City. Our website is www.mabcnyc.org.